Good morning, Brixington Church. Good morning. And good morning to those of you who are joining us online. A very, very warm welcome to everyone. It's good to see the faces I know and some faces that I don't really know yet, but you're all warmly welcome to join us in worship this morning. Such a special gift that we share, isn't it? For Mothering Sunday this year, one of my sons hit the nail on the head with the gift he bought his mum. He knows I love to read, and he knows I love jigsaw puzzles. So he bought me Mayhem in the Library. And it is absolute mayhem. There are 101 different things going on in this jigsaw puzzle. So to mum's delight, she had something to really get her teeth in and do, but it didn't end there. Because the 101 events that are shown in this jigsaw are 101 titles to books. So you have to not only do the jigsaw, but answer all the 101 questions with the names of the books. Well, some of them were very easy. A tiger sat at a table with a cup of tea is the tiger who came to tea. As a nana, I'm bound to know that, as I'm bound to know the cat on the bookcase who's got a hat on his head, the cat in the hat. But two bare men running away from the picture with caps on, arrows over their shoulders, carrying bows. Now, what is that? That really stuck me. It's we're going on a bear hunt. Huh? <laughs> now, it was, in a sense, a simple present, but it brought this mum a lot of enjoyment, and it brought enjoyment to my son and I at the tea time we shared when we tried to find as many answers to the names of the books as we could, and then he went on his phone, as they do, and found out the ones that we didn't know. It was a simple gift that brought a lot of enjoyment. Coming to church this morning is God's simple gift to you and I. He's brought us here today because he wants to give us that enjoyment, show us his love, and plant seeds of something that perhaps we've not seen, heard, or appreciated before into our mind and our spirit. And they're all based on the incredible word, which is what we use as our guidebook. I'm just going to pick out a few verses from Song 119. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Help me to understand the meaning of your commandments and I will meditate on your wonderful deeds. I will weep with sorrow. Encourage me by your word. Turn my eyes from worthless things and give me life through your word. Then I can answer those who taunt me, for I trust in your word. You made me. You created me. Now give me the sense to follow your commands. May all who fear you find in me a cause for joy, for I have put my hope in my word. Amen. 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 God's word speaks into our heart. And I challenge myself, as I challenge you today, that you will listen for what he is trying to say to you through what we sing, through the prayers that we will hear, through Malcolm preaching to us, for the readings from his word, from the friendship we will share even outside in coffee, because quite often then, confidences are shared. But please, don't just hold your hands out for the gift today. 
but receive it. Take something away with you that, like my jigsaw, brought so much joy into my life, will bring so much joy into your lives and our lives this morning. So we're going to stand and we're going to wholeheartedly praise him with our voices. If we're able to stand, God doesn't mind if you sit and sing. So we're going to start with praise him, you heavens, because he's up there and we're down here, but he is with us. Thank you. Praise Him, you heavens and all that's above. Praise Him, you angels and heavenly hosts. Let the whole earth praise Him. Praise Him, the sun, moon, and bright shining stars. Praise Him, you heavens and waters and skies. ask that you will speak to us. Speak clearly that we can hear you, be encouraged by you, know your presence, because we know you are a good God who wants the very best for his people. Bless those who are watching online, those who are at home because they're not well. Just lighten anything that is darkening their lives at this moment, we pray. And we ask this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Over all the earth, you reign on high. sunset sky but my one request Lord my only aim is 
please take your seats. Father, we just stand in awe in front of you because you are the Lion of Judah who breaks the chains. And Jesus is the Lamb of God who shed his blood that those chains would be broken for us forever. So just bring your prayers of thanksgiving to him. Even if it's just a sentence, Say your thank yous to him because I know he's real in your lives. I know he makes a difference in your lives because you share it with me and you share it with him. So share it with the family now that your God is a God who's real and walks with you. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, thank you. We thank and praise you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Jill, would you like to come and share with us for our prayers now? Please, sorry. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Let us pray. Father God, we bring our prayers to you as our everlasting, almighty Heavenly Father. You are the Alpha and Omega, Creator God. We love you, Father, for your faithfulness to us and your comforting arms when we are in distress. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who ministers to us and fills us with healing with peace and grace. Lord, we live in challenging circumstances and God writes the storyline of our lives through good times and hard times. We live in a fallen world and the world's media broadcasts in vivid detail the suffering and conflict in so many countries where warring factions fight one another for supremacy. We bring our intercessory prayers for those living in Sudan. We thank you for the airlifting flights of rescue in the last few days, but we pray also for the many thousands who are fleeing their homes into surrounding countries. And Sudan is surrounded by many countries. And the fear is that conflict will break out in a much wider region of Africa. Air, tank, and artillery strikes are continuing in Khartoum. And we pray your protection, Father, for those still trapped and for the many families split apart. We continue to pray for those who mourn loved ones in Ukraine and all those living in fear and persecution. We pray the United Nations can bring pressure to bear and initiate peace talks. 
there are so many places in the world where cruelty brings torture, imprisonment and death to their citizens. But we thank you, Father, for all the agencies and teams who go out from this country with hearts of compassion to minister, heal, and protect in all places of conflict. We know, Father, that you may not take sufferers out of harsh times immediately, but we pray for your sustaining grace to bring them through it. When things around us and in the world seem to be spinning out of control, Jesus invites us to come to him, not only for comfort, but also for direction. He helps us find a way forward. Psalm 62 reminds us that God is sovereign over global events and he is still in control. We pray for our nation and for peace on our streets. We pray for our local elections and our national government, that they will work to encourage and finance a more compassionate and fairer life for families, children, and elderly residents. We pray for our royal family as we approach the historic coronation of King Charles next weekend. We pray that you will bless them with a day where their support for one another will be evident. We pray for our emergency services and that while they'll be understandably stretched, there will be no incidents that cause harm or damage. We pray that street parties and celebrations around the country will be a time to bond our communities and their care for one another. We pray for all those who are known to us, who are struggling with physical, emotional, or mental pain, and for those in financial difficulties. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul reminds us that when we draw closer to Jesus in tough times, seeking his help, we grow in maturity and wisdom which equips us to help others as they endure adversity. Jesus' last words before he ascended into heaven were, I am with you always. God's promise is that I am with you and will watch over you. I will meet all your needs according to my glorious riches. Nothing in all creation will be able to separate you from my love. Father, we ask that your will be done, and to you be all the glory. We bring all our prayers to you in the precious name of your Son, Jesus, our Saviour and Redeemer. Thank you, Father. Amen. In our next song that Jean, Jean is going to introduce, um, I felt, I have felt all this week, a push from the Holy Spirit to lift our banner that you don't see very much, and it's the blue one, but it is the United Nations. And I just feel this is the time when we pray the Holy Spirit will descend we sang in our first song, You are King over all the earth. And we want to confirm that and to honor you, Lord. Amen. Spirit, break out. And as Jill has said, not just here in this place, but over all of this beautiful but sometimes troubled and tragic earth that is our home. Spirit, break out.
down onto your earth. Spirit, break out. Fill each life here, Lord, with whatever they're carrying, the burdens, the problems, the illnesses, the things that seem unsurmountable. 
and the things that won't stop niggling, Lord. Spirit, break out. Bring your peace down on us and our neighbor. And our neighbor might be here or it might be in a land far away. We think of Judith, wherever she's serving, of Andrew in Romania, of Elena in Mozambique. Our fellowship, who are working and serving and allowing the Spirit to use their lives in foreign places. And next week, we will speak to neighbors we will speak to family. If we're fortunate, we will be staying with family. Spirit, break out. Flood us that we can flood those that we love. For the cry of our heart is we want them to know you. For those of our church who are suffering and some are in really dark places with ill health, spirit, break out. Let your peace come down. May they this morning, in whatever they're experiencing, whatever they're feeling, even in utter confusion, Lord, spirit, come down. Touch their lives and the lives of those who serve, look after, and are with them. Spirit, come down. Come down and rest among us, we pray. Yes, amen. Amen. Well, Malcolm, it's a long, long time since I've stood on this stage and you're going to come and stand beside me. But we warmly welcome you this morning with a real Brixington welcome. I think I'm now on. <laughs> Good. We jokingly said, or I jokingly said, and I'll make up to that fact, it's going to be interesting to see how you cope with being online, because we know you don't like standing still when you're preaching. <laughs> it's a useful discipline. <laughs> so let me pray for you. Father, joking aside, we've asked the Spirit to break out and break down into our lives. Break through what Malcolm has taken on board from you and will share with us this morning. Let us not forget it. Let it perhaps be the seed that we need to take into our lives and take with us. Just be with him and be with us, we pray. Amen. Amen. Bless you, Malcolm. Thank you very much. It, uh, I spoke to Steve and obviously... Um, our part, we are another part of God's kingdom in this town, and Benedict is actually over in Estonia at the moment, helping to lead a mission. So thank you for your welcome. Now, the Lord's language is a bit different to ours. If you think about a tree, we tend to think what it looks like, draw a picture, or everything about it is its appearance. But in Hebrew, in God's language, it's much more personal because when the Hebrew speaks of a tree, it doesn't matter what it looks like. It's what is it doing? And that a tree is used in Psalm 1 and Jeremiah 17 to explain a godly man or woman. What a healthy tree does is put down roots deep, draw up the sustenance, and then bear blossom and fruit that is beautiful and sustaining. Now today we're going to think about Joseph. And he lived about 4,000 years ago, obviously in the Holy Land, about 2,000 years before Jesus. And he was born into a dysfunctional family. So let's just look what happened before he bo was born. And I'm going to speak about his, um, his apprenticeship, his hidden apprenticeship, and then about his outstanding public service. Now, his father was Jacob, 
And Jacob's name means dodgy, Dell boy, possibly. And he certainly was. He was born with a twin, Esau, who came out first. But Jacob managed to get both the birthright and the blessing out of Esau. The first one, because Esau despised the word of the Lord and sold it to him. The second one, he was actually deceitful. And Esau wasn't the kind of person you could do this to. So Esau was planning to bump him off. Directly their father died, who was nearly dead. So he did a runner. And he went off to some of his mother's relatives and looked after their sheep and so on. And to Laban. And Laban said, well, what do you want? You shouldn't work for me for free. And he said, I want to marry your younger daughter, Rachel. Because he had two daughters, um, Leah, who Jacob didn't like very much, and Rachel. And so Laban said, ah, that's good. If you work seven years, you can marry Rachel. Great. And he worked, and it seemed like nothing. And then Laban said, we've got to have a big party. So they had about a week-long party, which is fairly normal. And we don't know, but it's probable that Laban got Jacob very drunk. Because when he woke up in the morning, he had married Leah by mistake. Now, this didn't please him. I mean, that's one of the more serious things that can go wrong at a wedding. So, this, um, so uh, they said, don't worry. Leah's my older daughter. I had to get rid of her. I had to sh get shot of her first. But you can marry Rachel as well. Of course, you'll have to work another seven years. So Laban was worse than Jacob, really. But anyway, he did. And then... Um, and Leah had a, a lady called, Bil, um, called Zilpah, who was her maid. They kind of went around in twos then, the lady and her maid, and Rachel had Bilhah. And so, obviously, Jacob was looking forward to a big family with Rachel. But what happened is that God felt sorry for Leah, because Jacob didn't love her. So he gave her, he, he started, it was Leah who started having sons. She had four sons. She had Reuben, Simon, um, Levi, and Judah. Now, whether she was going around singing 4 nil, 4 nil, I don't know. But Rachel was pretty fed up with this. and She was getting quite desperate. And so she said to her number two, Bilhar, you come and get some for my side of the family. So Bilhar slept with Jacob and had Dan and Naphtali. Leah said, two can sleep, can play at that game. So she sent Zilpah in, Gad and Asher. So you had eight, eight sons, none of them from Rachel, which is the only person he really wanted. He didn't reckon much on these sons. He only really wanted to marry her. Then the oldest son, Reuben, found some mandrakes and gave them to Leah. And for some reason or another, Rachel was addicted to these mandrakes. She had to have them. There is a drug called mandragora, a bit like cocaine, really, so she might have been high on that. There was also a theory that maybe it would make you more fertile. So, um, Leah then had two more sons. Ray Jacob didn't have anything to do with this, really. Two more sons, Yisachar and Zebulun. Ten sons and a daughter. But then, finally, Rachel was pregnant. And, before jo and this was Joseph. And before Joseph was born, they, there was a lot of envy in the family because the other ten sons knew that Jacob would spoil him when he came. They knew that because he was the one he really meant to have. So when he was born, his father did spoil him. Jacob did spoil him and it didn't help him at all. He, at one stage, he bought him a coat, a flashy coat. It wasn't technically a dream coat. This is 4,000 years ago in the Middle East. But it was special and obviously different. And his brothers were en became more and more envious of him. Another thing that happened was that he worked with his brothers, looking after the flocks and so on, but he was used to tell tales on them. He went on and worked with them and came back and told tales. And they didn't like it at all. Now, when he was 17, we know he, his, Jacob sent him, said, go and see the brothers, because he was at home, Go and see the brothers and see how they're getting on and tell me all what's happening. So he went off to Shechem 
But the brothers, whether deliberately or not, had deliberately moved, probably moved, they had moved on to Dothan, which was 15 miles further on. But now we see what Jacob was like. He was always diligent, hard-working, and he doesn't take, he wasn't going to wander back home. So he found out, he questioned everyone around, found out they were in Dothan, and went there. Another thing that had just happened before this, Joseph did love the Lord because Jacob did explain about the, the heavenly ladder between earth, God and earth, and that this family was going to be something really special and that God was going to work, and he believed it. And just before he went to see his brothers, again, he had two dreams. The first dream was he, they were all sheaves of wheat, and all the other sheaves bowed down to his sheaf. So God was telling him, you're going to have a really fruitful life. The second dream was they were all stars, and the, and the mother and father were sun and moon, and all the stars bowed down to his star. So God promised him fruitfulness and promised him status. But he was unwise enough to think that his brothers would love to hear these dreams. As you know, he was a teenage boy. He had the emotional awareness of a steamroller. So he, he said, oh, you'll be glad to hear this, and he told them, and this made them even worse. Oh, so you're the special one. You're not only spoiled, but you're going to do that, are you? So when he came to see them, um, they were off and Dothan. They saw him coming. They wanted to get rid of him. They thought, had enough of him. There were various ideas what they could do, kill him, obviously. But what they did finally was throw him in a pit, rip off his fancy coat, and for their good fortune, as it were, some merchants came back, and obviously merchants in those days, you could buy and sell people as well as things. So they sold him. Great. They got rid of him. Then they realised their father might be a bit concerned, so they s smeared goat's blood on his fancy coat and took it home and said, uh, we found this. Is this your son? It certainly was. So he was sold to Potiphar. Potiphar was a big wheel in Egypt, the captain of the bodyguard. And how did... Joseph react. This was strike one. Well, he worked really hard. He was honest, he was capable, and was diligent. So soon he became the steward. And Potiphar knew he could trust him. I don't think he trusted all the other ones before, but he realised he could trust him with everything. But all was not well, because his wife was not a good lady. She, was a rather, she felt that one of her privileges was to have access to any of the nice male servants around. So she tried to get him to come with her. But, you see, he loved the Lord. He knew what was right and wrong. He said, no, that will be betraying Potiphar and going against God. And so he made sure he wasn't with her uh, when there's no one else around. But in the end, he couldn't avoid it. She grabbed him, and he had to leave his coat in her hand and so she had him sent to, to prison. She framed him and blamed him for doing what he actually wouldn't do and had him thrown into jail. Now, it's all right, you might say, well, he had these special dreams. God promised him fruitfulness and promised him status. But you may say, I haven't had any dreams. But do you know, if we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, if we are following him, we can walk with God just as much as Joseph because Jesus told us I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me, you will bear a lot of fruit. He's already given us that promise. And he told, and we read in the Gospels, um, he came to his own people, his own people didn't receive him, but to those who received him, he became the right to become sons of God. We're born again of the Spirit. So, Joe, we don't need the dreams. We've got it in Scripture. In fact, it says in 2 Corinthians 1 that all God's promises are yes and amen. So if Joseph could go on walking with God, then so can we. And there's also something else about this. We're in a culture where everyone says, oh, how do you feel? How do you feel about this? How do you feel about that? I'm not saying that's wrong. Sometimes we must speak our feelings. But the Lord is far more interested in what we get up to rather than what we feel. People don't need to parade our feelings. So, this was strike two. He'd been sold into slavery, and then quite innocently been thrown into prison. And of course the prisons then 
Uh, well, not like they were now. It would mean that within a short time, there was virtually no sanitation. You'd only eat scraps. Um, you would soon live, look a wreck, look like a wreck. So the jailer in the prison wasn't looking forward to seeing him because he was used to people who were not happy being in there, who were cursing and swearing and spitting him. That's what he was used to. And so, but when Joseph came in, he nearly fell over because Joseph walked in, and because he's walking with God, he knows what's right and wrong, so he comes and says, good morning, I'm Joseph, can I be of any help? And when he picked himself up the floor, he thought, oh, well, he's obviously a nutter as well, yeah, oh, I'll give him the worst and dirtiest job to do. So he says, yes, you can, you can go and clean out all the, the cells and what have you, and thinks, oh, that'll sort him. But it didn't. He went on serving, and he was more efficient than the jailer. He was hardworking and honest. I thought, my goodness. And not only that, he got on very well with the other prisoners. Usually they just were very great tense and had fights and what have you, have you. But he listened to them. And unwittingly, he became the first ever prison chaplain. And he wasn't even paid. So despite this terrible set of circumstances, he was doing what he knew was right. He was walking with God. He realised that to receive God's promises, he needed to do what God said. <laughs> he needed to follow him, be faithful, serve others, and, and, and do stuff right. And not just for a while, because we know he was probably thrown in prison, we know, 17, probably about 19 or 20 he was thrown in prison. And we next hear of him eight years later, and you could stay in prison all your life or be taken out for execution. So the next we hear about him is when he's 28 and Pharaoh's thrown his baker and cupbearer in jail. And they suddenly have both have dreams on the same night. And because, because he's like a chaplain to them, chats to them, he says, look, tell me your dreams and I'll, I'll tell you what they mean. Surely God can do, do that. So they give him his dreams and he tells the cupbearer in three days he will be back at his job. And the baker, three days, he will leave prison, but not so nice, he'll be executed. And that actually happens. And of course, he said to the cupbearer, look, when you get back, do have a word with Pharaoh for me, because it's not fair that I'm here. So strike one was toxic masculinity. His brothers get rid of him. Strike two, toxic femininity. We're all fallen, you know, and he gets thrown into jail. Strike three is when he gets back to his job, the um, cupbearer gets all about him. Now we come to see what's happened. But in two, now we go to two years later. And remember, he's been in jail for a long while. And in uh, Genesis 41 and verse 9, then what happens is that God decides Joseph is ready. So he, he um, gives Pharaoh a dream that really shakes him up. And he asks everyone, he asks everyone, oh dear, um, no one could tell him what the dream is. Then the chief cupbearer, the one who had forgotten all about him in strike three, toxic, in, toxic indifference, and said to Pharaoh, today I'm reminded of my shortcomings. Pharaoh was once angry with his servants and he imprisoned me and the chief baker in the house of the captain of the guard. Each of us had a dream that same night and each dream had a meaning of its own. Now a young Hebrew was there with us a servant of the captain of the guard. We told him our dreams and he interpreted them from us, giving each man the interpretation of his dream. And things turned out exactly as he interpreted them to us. I was restored to my position and the other man was hanged. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph. He was quickly brought from the dungeon. When he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream and no one can interpret it, but I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, in my dream I was standing on the bank of the Nile when out of the river there came up seven cows, fat and sleek, and they grazed among the reeds. After them seven other cows came up, scrawny and very ugly and lean. I never see such ugly cows in all the land of Egypt. The lean, ugly cows ate up the seven fat cows that came first. But even after they had debt them, no one could tell that they had done so. They looked just as ugly as before. Then I woke up. In my dreams, I also saw seven ears of corn, full and good, growing on a single stalk. After them, seven other ears sprouted, withered and thin and scorched by the east wind. 
The thin ears of corn swallowed up the seven good ears. I told this to the magicians, but none could explain it to me. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he's about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears of corn are seven years. It is one and the same dream. The seven lean, ugly cows that came afterwards are seven years, and so are the seven worthless ears of corn, scorched by the east wind. They are the seven years of famine. It is just as I said to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he's about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will follow them. Then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten, and the famine will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered because the famine that follows it will be so severe. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God and God will do it soon. And now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that may come upon Egypt so that the country may not be ruined by the famine. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his officials, so Pharaoh asked them, can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the spirit of the gods? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater to you. So, Pharaoh is a very important person, okay? He's regarded as God. Sunshine of the sun god is upon him. Power of life and death over everyone. But God has shaken his cage. And he is distraught. He can't find out what these dreams mean. He knows he's distressed about them. And then the cupbearer remembers. And out comes Joseph. You can imagine how they had to change him. They had to give him good, make him look like an Egyptian, clean him up, make him look. And they bring him out. So here is Pharaoh, probably the most important person in the world, facing a Hebrew jailbird. And Hebrew was not nice in those days, Ivrit is the word, and it means um, someone who breaks boundaries, what we would call a vagrant. So he's not even an Egyptian. And Pharaoh is very kind. He asks him a question. I said, I hear you can interpret dreams. And he immediately contradicts him. Now, I think when that happened, there was a going through all the, the court because no one ever contradicted uh, Pharaoh. But he contradicted him for two reasons. One reason is because Pharaoh was used to being flattered and regarded as number one. Everyone told him, you're number one. You're, you know, you got, your God is revealed in you. Because the Egyptian gods, they had this. But Joseph knew he was number two because Joseph was walking with number one. If we're walking with number one, we never need to be afraid of men because we know whoever it is can't be number one. So he's not afraid of him, just as David wasn't afraid of Goliath because he was walking with God. So that's the first reason. He knows, and this is a wonderful thing for him, if we're walking with God, we never need to be afraid of anyone or anything else. Jesus said, do not fear them who can destroy. Just kill you and that's all. Fear God who sees the whole thing through. He can destroy both body and soul in hell. The second reason is if you look at what he says... He says, I can't do it, but God can. You see, he was jealous that God gets the glory. Now, this is a big thing. God uses those who give him the glory. He will not share the glory. We are told in Exodus 14, 34, 14, that God, whose name is jealous, is a jealous God. Now, what jealousy is not envy. It's not begrudging someone else. Jealousy is determining to get hold of and use what is rightfully yours. And God has a right of our devotion. He has a right for our love. And so he's saying to Pharaoh, you think you're number one, but actually you're number two. It's not me, you want to worry, it's God. Okay. Then he interprets the dreams. But he goes a bit further than this. And again, I can kind of hear them saying, 
What's he doing? Because God has said, what do these dreams mean? He tells him what they mean. But then he tells him what to do. Gives him some unsolicited advice. Because you've had these dreams, this is what you should do. You should pick someone really capable who can save up all this grain, and that's very difficult in a corrupt culture like that, and keep it for the other years. And of course, who's, who's Pharaoh going to pick? I mean, who's the one who's come up with all this? Him. And we don't, didn't read it today, but what he, ha he has outstanding per um, public service because he doesn't stay and have parties and all this blah. He goes zooming off to all the different places in Egypt. He has to set up systems. Uh, uh, in fact, he's seen as a wonderful manager. Set up systems which are not corrupt, whereby the, the corn is saved and it's ready for distribution. So that those dreams come true. They not only feed everyone in Egypt, but they actually feed his own family, the family through whom all God's blessings are coming. So as we look at Joseph, let's see it ourselves. Are our roots going down deep? When we get strike one, strike two, do we have a pity party? and rebel against what God's giving us in his providence? Or do we say, no, I'm holding on to God's word. Sorry, it's when things get tough that God works out his purposes. So that's a challenge. The challenge is, do we un understand the jealousy of God? He will not share his glory with another. No one. Our name doesn't matter. His name. His name is the only name that counts. And are we willing to be wholehearted? Because the whole thing about Joseph, he never even clicked that his, his brothers were against him. He just went all out for it. He loved God, he knew this was going, and he went for it. And I think this is an encouragement to us. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for all the privileges that you've given us in Christ Jesus. Thank you you've given us more than Joseph. Thank you that for 13 years he was learning, both in serving Potiphar and then about 11 years in jail, but still he followed you, still he knew that you would be faithful to your promises. And he worked full out, because wherever he worked, people saw he was blessed. And because of his public service, your name was honoured, and your people were fed, and others too. So Lord, whatever you have in mind for us, we know that you have in mind for us walking with you. You won't walk with us on our way. No, we must walk with you. And then we will know your blessing. So thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Malcolm. Malcolm challenges us that we need to, to walk with Jesus. And I chose as our last song, You Call Me Out Upon the Waters. And it takes me back to the picture from the book, The Shack, in which it is a fictional character, but he met with various aspects of the Lord. And one of them was to walk on water with him. And I loved the sentence in the book where he says to family and friends that I can never see water without thinking, will I walk on it? It's a great thought, isn't it? So we walk forward this morning. We take on board what Malcolm shared with us. We do walk out into a troubled world, but we might also walk out into good and nice things. So where we walk, the Lord will go with us as we follow him and try to do his way. Thank you, Andrea.
roads deep my faith will stand and I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves when ocean rest in your embrace for I Spirit, lead me when my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. My faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit. For I am yours, and you are mine. Oh, Lord, take us into next week to be the light and the salt that you want us to be. Let us walk upon the waters in your strength. Holy Spirit, nudge us and point your finger in our direction if we need to be aware of things we should be doing that we are not doing. Give us a conscience if we are using excuses to close down 
where you would have us be, saying what you would have us say, even thinking what you would have us think. Spirit, break out, we pray, in our lives, today and in the week ahead. Amen. Amen. Please sit. I just want to share something with you before I hand over to Simon. On Wednesday at 3 p.m., we have our prayer time for our church. I don't have to tell you how busy our church is. The things that God has called us to do and support and the places he's called us to be. It takes a lot of physical energy. It takes a lot of checking our diaries and making sure we're not double, broken, break, uh, double booking ourselves. And that's something I'm very clever at doing. We need to be working in tune with God. So I would encourage all of you that if you can possibly make that time slot on Wednesday, it's not an optional extra. It's where God anchors the work that he is doing here and in the estate and outside of us and with family and friends. God will move. He's a jealous God, as, God, as Malcolm shared this morning. He will move when he knows the heart of the people are his heart. So Debbie has got, and she will probably share with this, a carnation weekend planned ahead. I'm afraid I'm on holiday next week, and I won't be here on Wednesday. It would please my heart to know we've had more than a normal group here praying on Wednesday because we will move forward and we will make a difference and God will work through us and change things if we are really important with him. Prayer is so important. It is not a second best. And I fail at it. I do. I don't always take it seriously. Don't think I'm special but I want to see God working and I want to see you coming together, praying and hearing each other's prayers. They are so encouraging just to rest. You don't even have to open your mouth. You will be blessed to just say amen to what is offered. Some of you, because of your abilities, might not be able to get here. So three o'clock on Wednesday, pray at home. Make sure Simon or Norman or one of the deacons knows that you're doing that, that you've set that side. And it's not to polish our halos. It's to link up with our God. So please think about it. And as I say, I want to hear there are more than what is it we've been having, 24? Can we build that number up? It's only once a month, and it is so, so important if we want God's work to prosper. Thank you. Amen. Simon, over to you. So just to, to say those that are watching online, thank you for joining with us this morning. We hope that you've been blessed, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again online next week. And if you're able to come and join with us, you're more than welcome to do so. So God bless you. Thank you for joining with us.